Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 111, Dr. Joseph Jedwab on Divine Omnipresence, Part 1. Dr. Joseph Jedwab is a professor of philosophy at Kutztown University in Pennsylvania. After earning his bachelor's degree in philosophy and theology at King's College London, he earned his master's and Ph.D. in philosophical theology from Oxford University. He's also been a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Notre Dame. He's published several articles in analytic theology and metaphysics, and he blogs occasionally at trinities.org. I'm really glad to have him here today to talk with us about his article, God's Omnipresence, a Defense of the Classical View, which is forthcoming in the European Journal for Philosophy of Religion. Dr. Jedwab, welcome to the Trinity's Podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Dr. Jedwab, the term omnipresent means that God is in some sense everywhere. When you think about it, this is surprising. It doesn't seem to us like God is everywhere. And Christian sources speak of God as in heaven, wherever that is. So, why do theologians believe that God is everywhere? Well, I assume the principal reason would be from Scripture. There are various biblical passages that strongly suggest God is omnipresent. Do come to mind. There's uh, Psalm 139, which says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in shale, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. So that psalm seems to suggest that God is everywhere. That seems to be the answer to those rhetorical questions. Where shall I go from your spirit? Nowhere. You can't go anywhere from his spirit. So it doesn't explicitly say that God is everywhere, but it does seem to assume it. He doesn't enumerate all places, but he he spits out some examples. And no, I can't get away from you here. I can't get away from you there. So presumably you can't get away from God anywhere. So then God would be everywhere. Good. Yeah, that, that seems right. That seems how most people look at it. All right. And so there's also the prophet Jeremiah. In chapter 23, he writes... Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God afar off? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? And so again, those are some rhetorical questions that are supposed to have an obvious answer. The answer is, yes, I do fill heaven and earth. And that's supposed to be it. There is nothing else apart from heaven and earth. So God is everywhere. So I think that's the main reason theologians believe in God being omnipresent. There may be some more philosophical reasons that theologians have for thinking that God's omnipresent as well. If you think that God is somewhere, then you would think that it's the mark of a perfect being that that being not be limited or restricted in any way, including a spatial limitation or restriction. So if God is somewhere, He can't be not another place. If God is somewhere, God must be everywhere if there's no spatial restriction. So it seems like a limitation or an imperfection for him to be in one place but not another. Right. And somewhat relatedly, there would be something, I think, arbitrary or unprincipled about supposing that God is somewhere but not everywhere. Because if God is somewhere but not everywhere— then this would raise very awkward questions like, why isn't he in a few more places or a few less places? That seems kind of arbitrary when thinking about what God is like. And when you're trying to come up with a theory about what God is like, you try to um, come up with a theory that doesn't have the mark of the arbitrary or the unprincipled. So it seems to be a better theory about what God is like that if God is somewhere, God is everywhere. Dr. Jedwab, in your view, is it consistent to say both that God is in heaven or in the Jerusalem temple, but also that God is everywhere? 
Well, of course, if God is everywhere, then God is in heaven and in the Jerusalem temple. But I suppose by that you mean locally present so that he's not present anywhere else. And in that, I would say we need to make a distinction of senses. Perhaps there's one sense in which God is everywhere and another sense in which God is locally present. So God is, for example, in the holiest of holies in the Jerusalem temple, but nowhere else in that sense. So it's not to be understood that God is everywhere, and in the same sense, he's only in some places and not in others, but there might be a different sense in which God is in some places and not others, but not in that same sense in which he's everywhere. Right. Dr. Jedwab, on the face of it, Jesus was located in some places, but not in others. Yet mainstream Catholic tradition says that Jesus is fully divine, that he has the divine nature in addition to his human nature. But doesn't the Bible's portrayal of Jesus as moving around force us either to deny that he's divine or to deny that essential omnipresence is implied by divinity? So I don't think so. I don't think it's a problem for thinking that Jesus is divine and so has all the divine features, including omnipresence. It would be a problem for the following kind of view. If you thought that God was strictly and literally everywhere, and you also had what we might call a materialist conception of the incarnation, that is to say that Human beings are material beings, and so when the Son, who's the second person of the Trinity, becomes incarnate, that is, takes on human nature, that is to say, becomes human, that he becomes a material being. There are some views out there like that. For example, uh, Trenton Merricks, who is uh, a Christian philosopher, defends a view like that. That would be a problem for a view like that, because if you thought that God is at once, strictly and literally everywhere, but also a material being who is only locally present, who's only present where the human body is, and not anywhere else, then you have a real problem on your hands. But I think the tradition says that God is not strictly and literally everywhere. That's kind of the burden of my paper to make good on that claim. And in any loose sense, in which God is omnipresent, Jesus can be omnipresent in that loose sense, but also present in a a different sense with respect to his human nature or in his human body. So it's part of being human that we are located. So right now I'm in New York and you're in Pennsylvania. And you might wonder if human nature requires the human to be located in a way that rules out being everywhere in some sense. And you're saying, well, the sense in which Jesus is everywhere could be different than the sense he is somewhere only. Mm -hmm. Although we probably shouldn't get too deeply into strictly materialist views of incarnation, but uh, so the materialist is somebody who thinks that a human being is a purely physical object of some kind and they don't believe in souls, basically. And so, for materialists, they also have to say, just as any kind of Christian has to say, that Jesus was a real human, a real man, then that makes them say that insofar as he's a real man, he is a physical object. But then he has to have the kind of location that any physical object has. And then you're saying that would rule out a literal kind of divine omnipresence where God is literally located everywhere. Because then if Jesus as a physical human, purely physical human would be located only somewhere, not others. Right. But you're saying it's an easier problem to maybe get around if you have a more traditional view of human nature where there's a soul. So what is it particularly about a materialist view of humans that makes the problem worse? 
than it would be, say, for a Christian who is a dualist who believes in body and soul? So it's a combination of the view that for God to be omnipresent, he is strictly and literally in every place with the view that you're identical to an entirely material being, a human organism, and that human organism can't be strictly and literally everywhere. It right. wouldn't have the shape of a human organism if right. it was strictly and literally everywhere. Yeah. So it's that combination of views, which I don't know that anyone actually holds, but that would be a problem for that, that combination of views. For example, Trenton Merricks himself doesn't hold that God is strictly and literally in every place. That's not how he understands the doctrine of God's omnipresence. But he does hold that the eternal logos becomes a purely physical object. Correct. And so then it's got to have the kind of location that a purely physical object has. It's got to have spatial location and boundaries. That's right. But you're saying is if we don't understand divine omnipresence to be literal, then maybe there's a way out of it. That's right. I do want to make one qualification here. When I say strict and literal, the word strict is doing some work there because I don't want to suggest that the loose sense is a non-literal sense. Just as Aquinas talks about analogical predication being a literal form of predication, I don't want to just commit to saying that any non-strict sense is a non-literal one. Dr. Jedwab, I understand that theologians have differed among themselves in how they have understood divine omnipresence. What, in your view, are the main differences, or what are the main options for approaching this topic of divine omnipresence? Well, I think there are a number of divisions we can make here. The first is between thinking that God is strictly and literally everywhere, and thinking that God is everywhere only in some loose sense. Perhaps historically, we could identify the first group with people like the Cambridge Neoplatonists, John Locke, Isaac Newton, Samuel Clark. Perhaps there are some other figures there. That is just the view that God is strictly and literally everywhere in every place. But I think the more dominant tradition is that God is strictly and literally in no place. God is strictly and literally aspatial, that is spaceless. So there's one division that we have. And then among the people who think that God is strictly and literally aspatial, but do think that God is in some loose sense omnipresent, so everywhere, they may differ as to what they think generates the loose sense. Some people may emphasize the fact that God knows about every place. Others might emphasize the fact that God causally sustains every place. And each of those may generate a kind of loose sense in which God is everywhere. Of course, you could also combine those views. Now, often I run into theologians who seem to think that it's self-evident that no human concept or no human term literally applies to God, that things can only metaphorically apply to God. Would that be one species of view about divine omnipresence? they would be saying that it's like God is everywhere, or it's as if God is everywhere. Well, I suppose you could take that view and then have something to say in addition about the doctrine of omnipresence. I mean, there is the general view that no talk of God applies literally. All talk of God applies metaphorically. And then if you think of omnipresence then in metaphorical terms, you think that truly applies but metaphorically to God, that God is everywhere, and that would be a kind of view you have of omnipresence. I guess maybe they would take the view that since we can't grasp any of God's intrinsic features, then the question of divine omnipresence is really just a question about how or in what sense that term omnipresence 
or ubiquity or divine immensity. It's in what sense those terms are applicable to God. Isn't that right? Aren't they kind of almost choosing to stay with questions of language and leave aside questions of metaphysics? Yeah, I mean, uh, this kind of view could be motivated by different reasons. Um, the view that I'm more familiar with would be you can speak literally negatively about God. You can say what God is not. And you can also speak literally of how God relates to his creation or to his creatures. So I suppose that you might say that we could speak literally of God when we say that God is omnipresent, if we understood that purely in terms of God's relation to his creation. I guess that's not a species of your view, though, where you can only speak metaphorically of God. Yeah, that would seem to be speaking literally, but sticking to relational qualities, or it would be consistent with the view that you couldn't really get into God's intrinsic features, but you could only discuss kind of how God relates to us or how even how God appears to us or how God is causally related to us or things like that. Yeah, so it it's along those lines. But then, as you said, that would be going beyond language. If it's spelled out in terms of God's literal relations to us, then it would be going beyond language to explain what it is about God that makes the term applicable. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jedwab, let me go back to the, the Clark and Locke view for a minute. It's interesting, and I know this is not your own view, but you might think this would be an obvious way to approach the question of omnipresence. Just imagine that God is sort of like a, a gas that's that fills space. Uh, physicists used to believe in ether. God is like this invisible, like a physical object, but not physical in that he doesn't take up space, but he literally is everywhere. And then arguably he wouldn't have shape because he wouldn't have any boundaries at least if space is itself infinite, then God's just filling this infinite space. So Clark describes omnipresence. Well, actually, he describes space as a divine attribute. He identifies space with, he calls it the divine ubiquity, God's being everywhere. Why is this an unpopular view in mainstream Christian and specifically Catholic tradition? I don't know how to answer that historical question of why it's unpopular now. I'm trying to make sense of it myself. It seems to me to commit some kind of category error. A divine attribute is a feature or characteristic God has. Space is something made up of regions. It's something that has those regions as, as parts. And as far as I know, the way that science thinks about those regions, they're not kind of abstract things, but they're things that can have features in their own right. For example, in Einstein's general theory of relativity, he talks about space-time, and it has the feature of being curved. It's the curvature that accounts for gravity. So these space-time regions seem to have lots of features or characteristics in their own right. So going back, I just don't see how it could be that space itself is a divine attribute, even the divine attribute of omnipresence or ubiquity. It's been a while since I read Clark about this, but I'm guessing that he is in part inspired by Paul's comment in Acts, where Paul quotes this pagan poet as saying that we live and move and have our being in God. And so he's taking that literally, I guess, and refusing to make space into a thing. To the extent it's real, it's going to be dependent on things. But let's see, it's not just the relations between physical objects. I don't think he would identify it with Einsteinian space, I recall that Einstein doesn't want to admit anything into his theory that can't be cashed out in some kind of observational terms. Mm -hmm. So think about the word, work of um, William Lane Craig on time. He thinks, well, there's metaphysical time, which is what usually philosophers call time, but then he calls what Einstein's talking about physical time, which I guess is just a metric of the changes in things in the cosmos. You might think there's physical space 
I'm not sure if this space, it might be more imagined to be like a giant container uh, where it's possible for things to be, except not precisely a container because not a thing, but only an attribute and, but an attribute that can be, I guess, divided up somehow. Yeah, I would have thought the more naive starting point view would be that space is like a big container and then God occupies all of space. Like you said, as a gas might be spread out across a region. We can't take that too far, of course, because if you thought of God in those terms, the way that a gas is spread out over a region is by having um, different parts of the gas at different subregions different parts of the spatial region that it occupies. And I don't think any of us think of God in those terms as being this spread out thing that has different parts that occupy different places. I don't know what Clark and Locke would say about that. I do know that some present day metaphysicians countenance the idea of extended simples so physical things without parts, and yet they have spatial extension somehow. They're located in many places without having different parts in different places. They're just, I guess if you were willing to go along with that, you might be, uh, you might be friendlier. I guess my question really comes down to just what's kind of philosophically unattractive about the more naive view and one thing you've answered is, well, doesn't it conflict with divine simplicity? If it requires God to have parts, then the tradition was that if God had parts, then God would be dependent on those parts for his existence. They would explain his existence or something, and then he wouldn't be ultimate. He wouldn't exist without dependence on anything else, because he would depend on his parts. Right. I believe that you affirm divine simplicity, possibly for that and other reasons. I do make the assumption in my paper that God is simple, but by that I just mean that God has no proper parts. The doctrine of divine simplicity is understood in various ways, normally to mean something much stronger, that there are no metaphysical distinctions in God at all. You can't make a distinction between God and his attributes. Mm -hmm. So in a way that rules out parts, but also rules out any other kind of difference or distinction in God, yeah. Think about souls. Souls are supposed to be located, but it's not clear if they have a precise location. And people that believe that souls have location and can move around, which I would think is most people who believe in souls, they don't think souls exclude other objects from being in the same place like physical objects do, right? Right. So if a demon possesses somebody... The idea that at least that people imagine is that it, it physically goes within the person, but it doesn't have to kick anything else out. The, the person's soul is still there and it doesn't have to kick any matter out. It just can be in the same place at the same time as matter. Right. I don't know. I don't, I don't find the idea of being in a place, but not in the way that a material object is. I don't find that all that difficult to deal with. Right. I don't have settled views about how to approach this topic, though. That's why I'm talking to you. Right. I'm sympathetic to the view that there are immaterial mental substances, souls, that are embodied in human organisms and that we're identical to those souls. We have bodies. There are some people that think that souls are, again, strictly and literally in some place. I would assume that they think that's the soul is strictly and literally where the brain is or where certain subregions of the brain are that are responsible for the existence of the soul and its mental states. Or, yeah, it could even be a region around the body so long as it includes the brain. Well, I think that would be weird. <laughs> that would be weird, but this is a weird topic. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't see any reason to think that. I can see because of the causal relations that go on between the person and her brain, why we would think that the soul would be located there. But I, I couldn't see any similar reason for thinking that the soul is, is outside the body or in some larger region that includes the body. Yeah. Well, I think we might have put our finger on a reason why some people are sympathetic to what I call the naive view or the, just a literalistic view, which is if you believe in souls and you think they're located, and then you ask yourself, well, why does Joseph's soul in control of his body and Dale's soul is in control of Dale's body? It looks like an obvious answer would be that's where his soul is. His soul is where, somewhere where his body is and my soul is over here. And that's why they're able to cause and to be affected by that particular body, but not some other. That's right. If you think being in the same place as is required for basic causal interaction, two-way interaction, you might be tempted to say the same thing about God. You might think that the reason that God can act anywhere immediately and without using arms and legs or any kind of intermediary, he can just immediately affect anything in any part of space is that, well, he's just, he's there. Maybe he's completely there in some sense. And this would explain at least his ability to um, directly affect everything, if not also be affected by everything. Well, I don't know that we need to explain those things. There is a problem, and I'm not sure I can reconstruct all the details, but it's called the pairing problem for mind-body dualism, mm -hmm. which is why is it if you had two perfect duplicates, two duplicate minds, two duplicate bodies, what would explain the fact that it's this mind that causally interacts with this body rather than the other duplicate one? Especially since the minds we might think on dualism don't have a spatial location, then that would be particularly problematic or troublesome. We may think they don't have a spatial location if we're doctrinaire Cartesians, but uh, well, actually... We're not doctrinaire Cartesians. Well, I know we're not. Uh, <laughs> I don't think dualists are, uh, ni neither doctrinaire Cartesians nor Platonists. Two of my former professors in my PhD program wrote articles about this, Jaguan Kim mm. and Ernie Sosa, and they just took... Cartesian dualism on which souls don't have any location to be just the obvious definition of dualism. And they thought that what you call the pairing problem is just unsolvable. They thought this was a terrible problem. They thought it was an objection against dualism. And I remember hearing uh, Dr. Kim present this at Brown when I was a student there. And I, I raised my hand and pointed out that, well, you know, some dualists think that souls are in space. You got uh, Henry Moore, I had just recently read, was talking about this, and he just kind of made fun of it. I think I think he he sort of mocked it as a Dale Tuggy view, but hmm. I just told him some. <laughs> this was something that famous philosophers had said that people were dualists long before Descartes, and will be dualists long after Descartes is forgotten. I think the whole group of people we identified as thinking that God is strictly and literally everywhere throughout all space. Those also tend to be people who are mind-body dualists who think that the soul is strictly and literally in some place. Yeah, I think so. So all the Cambridge Neoplatonists and also John Locke. Mm -hmm. And then I would assume, but I haven't looked into this, Newton and Clark. I think so. Yeah, and they just they, they were sympathetic to Descartes in some ways, but they did not accept his idea that the one defining attribute of minds is that they think and that the one defining attribute of matter is that it's extension that it takes up space they didn't necessarily accept that lock stock and barrel at least the mind part the soul part right plus i mean it's a crazy view anyway it's not essential to minds that they're conscious because sometimes we're unconscious <laughs> right he has to just deny that that is a problem for, for Descartes, that's true. Yeah, but not for most dualists. I would just, I think souls are essentially able to think, but whether they're actually able to pull it off in a circumstance may require having a body that's suitably fitted to it or something else. And I want to add just one more thing about this pairing problem. Historically, 
I think it goes back to John Foster, who was at Oxford University. He was a, a fellow um, and tutor of Brasenose College. He came out with an article uh, on the pairing problem in the 60s, I think in the American Philosophical Quarterly, and that's referred to by Ernest Sosa, who picks it up, and then that's passed on to Jay Won Kim. Mm. Whenever anyone talks about the pairing problem, I always like to uh, make that historical point so that people don't forget about John Foster. If memory serves, isn't John Foster an idealist? He is. He is, well, I mean, he is now, he's now dearly departed. He died quite a few years back now, but he was one of the last remaining Barclay and idealists together with Howard Robinson, and they were good friends. So then material objects just turn out to be, on this view, experiences, essentially. Right. They are logically constructed from sense experiences. Yeah. So they don't believe in matter if matter is something mind independent. Right. Not a popular view. <laughs> no. An interesting view, to be sure. But back to this pairing problem. So Dean Zimmerman explicitly has as the solution to the pairing problem that souls are, strictly and literally, in some place. Mm. But it's not the only solution, I think. And John Foster himself had um, other solutions that he proposed, one of which was to think about either laws of nature or powers or dispositions that are not general, but pick out a particular individual. So there could be a law of nature or a power that a soul has that relates not just to a body of some kind or the general features or characteristics of a body, but are directed at this body. So that even if there were a perfect duplicate of that body, this mind would still only relate to this body rather than any other duplicate. That would be a strange law of nature. <laughs> yeah, well, he calls it scope restricted. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So on this topic of minds and bodies, Dr. Jedwab, one theme that you see sometimes in Christianity, but maybe more prominently in Hindu thinking about God, is the idea that space or all the things in space or the two of those together are something like God's body, either literally or metaphorically, that it is God's body or God's relationship to space or the spatial universe is a lot like the relationship between your soul and your body. What's your take on that type of view? I'm not sure when I think about that. I'm inclined to say the world or the universe is not God's body, but I'm not entirely sure why, I suppose. There are some similarities that we can find in the embodiment relation that you find between, let's say, a human mind and a human body, and between God and the physical universe. On the one hand, one is an immaterial being, and the other is a material being. We know about the states of our body, or at least some states of our body, just like that, without knowing something else. We know about some of the states of our body immediately or directly without knowing that by way of anything else. I know about the immediate environment outside of my body because of how it affects parts of my body. But I can know about, for example, whether I'm in a state of pain or a state of pleasure immediately, not by way of it having any effect outside of my body first. Mm -hmm. So you might say, likewise, God directly knows what goes on in various places in the world. God knows what's going on in the world directly or immediately in that same way, not by way of knowing something else. Right. He doesn't have to ask somebody. He doesn't have to use his eyes and receive signals from them. It's just, if it happens, he just automatically knows it. Just like if you are 
I don't know, fearful, you'll usually be immediately aware of that. Right. And presumably that's something in your body. I mean, or at least it evolves something in your body, namely brain changes. Right. So you don't know about them typically as brain changes. You know them as feelings or emotions, but there's some connection between the two. Now you said, Dr. Jedwab, that your first reaction is to be skeptical or hostile towards the suggestion that the world is like God's body or that it literally is God's body, at least. I wonder if that has to do with other commitments that you have about what sort of being God is. So when you're theorizing about divine omnipresence, what other things are you assuming about God? Well, let me start this way. I think there is a much fuller story to tell about what embodiment looks like when it comes to human beings. And I, I don't think that that kind of embodiment carries across to the case of God and the universe. So when I think about what it is for each of us to be embodied in a human organism, I think that we are radically dependent on that human organism for our existence and also for our mental features. We are, I think, souls that are related to this body, but say we have a, a mental state of pain or a mental state of pleasure, that's because of something going on in the brain. And I think the laws of nature are set up that way so that when you have a brain that's in a certain state, it will naturally give rise to a soul that has a mental state of a certain kind. And I don't see anything like that when it comes to the relation between God and the world. Perhaps this has something to do with perfect being theology, where we think that it is not a mark of perfection. In fact, it's a mark of imperfection to think of God as radically dependent on the physical universe in that way. God doesn't depend on the universe to exist. God created the universe and could have failed to create the universe if he so chose. He was free to make a decision one way or the other. So God exists independently of the universe. And in general, the features or characteristics that God has likewise don't depend on the universe. Of course, what God knows about the universe in some way depends on how the universe is. But we also have to remember God created it that way in the first place. God is what theologians call ase. He has aseity. He exists independently, and so he can't depend on the world for his any of his perfections, any of his knowledge or power. And if we say, like most Christians do want to say, that God didn't have to create, well, then that would just rule out the world being an essential part of God, at least, or something that he in any way needs, because then you're saying that it's possible that he should never have created. Right. But Dr. Jedwab, if we say that the world is not God's body, indeed God doesn't have a body, what about the case of the Incarnation then? Because you might think, well, that is just God having a body. So I do in fact think that in some sense God does have a body. The Son is God, the second person of the Trinity is God, and the Son, when he assumes human nature, becomes a human who has a human body. So I do think that God does have a body, albeit uh, a human body, and that is only in the person of the Son, not also in the person of the Father and Holy Spirit. And in that case, I think that the Son has the relation to a human body that we do. He continues to have the divine nature, so he continues to have divine features and characteristics, but he takes on distinctively human features and characteristics in his state of embodiment. Dr. Jedwab, thanks for talking with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. This week's Thinking Music has been So Far, So Close by Jazar. Got a new review on iTunes this week in the U.S. iTunes store. A user named GArst1 says, quote, Listening to this kind of podcast is what makes me listen to podcasts, that is, to expand my mind and gain more knowledge to think about God. Dr. Tuggy, an awesome scholar trained in analytic theology and philosophy, talks about theories that deal with Trinity. This podcast also has excellent interviews with experts and debates, very deep, thought-provoking, and intelligent, end quote. <laughs> 
That was the comment attached to a five-star review. GRST1, thanks so much. If you'd like to help us by giving us a review in the iTunes store, you can look at trinities.org slash blog slash review, and I've got step-by-step -step instructions there for you. I also want to send out a thanks to Keegan in Texas for his one-time donation through PayPal, and to Ronald in California for his recurring monthly donation. Guys, thanks so much. If you'd like to contribute a small amount each month or one time, you can do that through the orange buttons that you see on the right of any blog post at trinities.org. Next week, more conversation with Dr. Jed Wobb. We go way out into the deep waters of metaphysics, getting more into the actual content of his paper that we mentioned in this episode. And before I go, don't forget to share this episode on social media if you enjoyed it. Help us get the word out on Facebook, Twitter, or Pinterest. It's easy to share any blog post, including podcast episode blog posts, using the buttons that you see on the right of the screen at trinities.org. See you next week. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.